Well, now I want to call your attention this evening to the words which are to be found in the book of Revelation in the 21st chapter and the 5th verse, the first portion of the 5th verse in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. Now we are meeting together thus on the first Sunday evening of a new year. It happens to be actually January the 1st itself. And it is the business of the preaching of the gospel, as I understand it at any rate, to show the relevance of the gospel and its message to any and every occasion or situation in the life of men in this world. That doesn't mean that I believe in topical preaching, which I heartily abominate. But it does mean that I, I am concerned to show that there is no situation in which we can ever find ourselves, but that the gospel will have something to say to us in it and about it. And it is so with the observance in this way of the passing from one year to another year. Now the world pays great attention to this. This is the first year in 1956. It's no longer 1955. And the world, I say, points to that, calls attention to it. It is an occasion which is used by men in almost every walk and department of life. The businessman winds up his accounts, closes his books, starts afresh, stock takes, and so on. And indeed, this is something that is done by the statesmen, done by the leaders of the nations. They stop, they review the past, they look to the future, they give messages. The whole world, as I say, in various ways, pays great attention to this change from one day to the next, from one year to the following year. And it does so because it has a feeling, somehow or another, that this is a significant matter, and that the change from 1955 to 1956 is something to which we should not only pay attention, but is also something to which we should look forward. Now, there is nothing, perhaps, which is more remarkable about mankind than uh, the way in which it persists in holding on to the idea of hope. A poet has put it very perfectly when he says, Hope springs eternal in the human breast. And uh, it is, as I say, a fact. It's uh, a very remarkable fact. Indeed, uh, there is something quite astonishing about it. This uh, holding on to hope is something that is so uh, deeply rooted in men, in human nature, in mankind, that uh, we really do things which are more or less quite ridiculous when you stop to look at them and to examine them rationally. Take, for instance, this very thing to which I'm referring the difference between last night and tonight. Now the world, I say, sees an element of hope in that. We've simply passed from last night to tonight, and yet the world says now there's a significance in that. We've started 1956, and it's said in a hopeful manner, as if 1956, because it's 1956 and not 1955, is really going to produce something. It's a good thing, people say, to get to the end of an old year and to start a new year. That's uh, one of the expressions of this hopefulness to which I'm referring. Well, now, as I say, the moment you stop to examine it and to dissect it, you see, of course, that it's quite irrational. It's only an artificial division made by men. It's purely a matter of something on a calendar. There is no real difference. 
Yesterday runs into today and today into tomorrow. There's really one great continuity, but we say 12 o'clock midnight, start again, 1 o'clock. It's quite artificial. There's no start as such. But we thus, you see, show this element of hope that is in us. This uh, feeling that we've got that somehow the future is going to make things different and things are going to be better. So we cling even to an artificial division like that into time and into calendars, 1955-56. That's but, I say, an illustration in passing. Of the deep hold that this idea of hopefulness has in the human race. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. You can knock us down, you can buffet us and baffle us, but still we come up again. Ah, oh, there's a new year coming, we say, wait a minute. Or we are finishing the winter and spring's at hand, and summer things are going to be better. I think you'll all agree that, uh, I'm not exaggerating it, that it's there. Indeed, we uh, are almost desperate in this matter of hope. And so we cling to anything, however artificial it may be, and uh, try to persuade ourselves that it really is uh, going to make a difference. Well, now, this to me is a very interesting matter. And it is particularly interesting when you look at it and examine it in the light of the Scriptures, in the light of the Bible. When you look at it in the light of the Christian message, the Christian gospel. And, uh, as I was saying at the beginning, the great business of the preaching of this gospel, as I understand it, is just to make us think. God forbid that anybody should have the idea of this gospel that it's something which is designed to do the exact opposite. There are many who think of it like that, I know. They think it is the kind of dope of the people, a kind of drug which is administered, and that uh, the great function of Christianity is that it enables you to forget your troubles and your problems for a while. You just pull down the blinds and you meet together and you sing your hymns and you spend your time in that manner and you've forgotten the great world and its problems outside. That is a complete travesty of the gospel. Indeed, the whole purpose of the gospel is to make us think and to make us examine certain presuppositions, certain ideas on which we work, certain thoughts which govern us, and none more important than this whole question of the hopefulness of mankind and the pathetic way in which it feels or tries to persuade itself at any rate that the coming of 1956 is a good thing and that it's somehow going to make a marvelous difference. Now I say the gospel tells us to examine that and to dissect it and to analyze it. And as we do so, I think we discover certain things like this. The first thing we observe is the very important and vital confession that the world thus makes as it pins its hope to things which are so utterly artificial and irrational. The world, I say, by trying to cheer itself with thoughts of 1956 is making a tremendous admission. And what is that? Well, the admission is this that things are, are not well as they are. It's an admission and a confession on the part of mankind that the state of the world is terrible, that we are surrounded by terrible problems and trials, that somehow or another things have gone wrong and that the situation is indeed desperate. Thank God, we say, 1955 has gone, ring out the old, ring in the new. What a confession. It is, as I'm suggesting, almost a confession of desperation, and yet it isn't. And it's just there, the vital analysis of the gospel comes in. Looked at with gospel eyes, we can see that it is desperate. But if we don't have gospel eyes, we shall not see the desperation, as I'm going to show you in a moment. But at any rate, I say, it is a tacit admission that things are not well with us as they are. 
Now, men never likes to admit that openly. If you come to him and say, well, now, let's look at life in terms of the Christian message. And the Christian message is that uh, men uh, has gone wrong and that his world is in a state of chaos. And now the natural man says, I, I don't agree with that, I don't accept it. He at once uh, begins to praise life and to defend life and to say that things, after all, are not as bad as that. The natural man regards the biblical diagnosis of men as pessimistic. They say, you know, that preaching about sin, it's very depressing and it's very pessimistic. Surely, they say, the business of the gospel at any rate is to give us some sort of cheer and assurance. No, but in the first instance, the gospel does not do that. It asks us to face the facts. And I'm suggesting to you that this pathetic hopefulness of men is a tremendous admission of failure. It's an admission that he's not happy with things as they are. It's an admission that he's got a feeling that they ought to be very much better. And that really he is almost overwhelmed by his troubles and by his problems. It is an admission, isn't it? That in spite of all that he boasts about civilization and the advance of men and development and evolution, it's an admission that in his heart of hearts he knows and he cannot see any evidence of this marvelous development and advance and evolution. He's really admitting that things are desperate. Now, if you put it to him directly, I say he'll never admit that. He will talk about this evolutionary process. He will look back across the centuries and he'll say, My word, haven't we advanced? Haven't we traveled since then? How wonderful modern man is with all his knowledge and all his culture and all that he has at his disposal. You listen to them, and you'd almost think that the world is perfect. But if the world is so perfect, if men are so developed and evolved and advanced, why do we pin our faith so much to 1956? Why have we got this hope that something's going to happen? No, no. You see, it's a contradiction of what we say theoretically. Indeed, I say this hopefulness of mankind is a tremendous admission that as things are at the moment, they are very bad, that the world is sick, that the world is in trouble, the world is in pain, the world is in a state of confusion. That's the first thing I see it. But then I see another thing, and this is the thing that brings us directly to our gospel. And that is the utter vanity of this hope. Indeed, I'd even use another word, the utter folly of this hope. Now, no man could really work himself up into a mood of optimism because of the beginning of 1956 if he really sat down and thought. It's because men do not think it's because they harbor these illusions. It's because they manufacture these fantasies that they hold on to this spirit of hopefulness because it's quite unreal. Now, this is something that I think I can prove to you. Take that section that we read out just now out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, there is a man who, say what you like about him, at dinner it was a wise man and a profound observer of life. Probably they are right to say that it was King Solomon who wrote that book. So that there, you see, we have a book that is at the very least nearly a thousand years before Christ. There is something that was written very nearly 3,000 years ago. And there you see that philosopher king. He's looked at life and he's examined it. And that's his conclusion. Vanity of vanities, he says, all is vanity. He says, there is no new thing under the sun. He says, in effect, I used to think there was. 
I listened uh, to what people said and I pinned my faith into that. I always felt something good was going to come and that things were going to be better. But he says, I've observed that they don't, that they're not. The rivers run into the sea and yet the sea is never full. It seems to go back to the beginning. It's just a cycle. The sun rises, the sun sets, it comes up again. And so with everything. Everything's going round in cycles. What has been shall yet be. What is now has already been, it's going to be again. There is no new thing under the sun. And therefore to pin your hope to that, he says, is vanity. It's vanity of vanities. There is nothing which is more monstrous than that. Now that was a sheer bit of observation. That's pure philosophy. This man has just noted facts. And he says, it's obvious. I see it quite clearly. It's like a graph. I can draw it. There it is. Now a man, I say, nearly 3,000 years ago was capable of observing that and drawing that deduction. And yet how slow we are to do that. You see, we were alive a year ago and we did exactly the same thing about passing from 1954 to 55. And we did it from 53 to 54. And we've been going on doing it. And still we say, ah, 1956 has come in spite of what we know to be the fact. The whole of history demonstrates the rightness of the conclusion to which the author of Ecclesiastes came. I've quoted it many a time before and I'm quoting it again because it seems to me in many ways to be the beginning of the gospel. The famous dictum of Hegel. History teaches us that history teaches us nothing. If only history did teach us, if only we were all wise enough to learn the lesson of history, we wouldn't have an atom of faith in 1956. Because history teaches us quite plainly and quite clearly the very thing that was arrived at as a conclusion by Solomon in writing Ecclesiastes. What I mean is this, that clearly you see that history is a continuous process and that nothing is more striking about it than the sameness. That's why when you go back and read your Old Testament, you might very well be reading a modern book. I refer to Solomon with all his wisdom, yes, but read all about his life. And see how even a man as wise as Solomon went astray. And wise men today are doing exactly the same thing. And Solomon's father, David, he was a wonderful king, a most exceptional man. But oh, look how he could fall. And great men are still falling. History but repeats itself. What has been is still it shall be, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, is simply the truth in this respect. Our Lord has put it for us once and forever in a very striking state. He says, as they were in the days of Noah, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and knew not until the flood came, even so they shall be in the days of the Son of Man. As they were in the days of Sodom, the same things, even so, he says, they shall be. Now that's the lesson of history. The lesson of history is, I say, that man continues the same. And yet, as I'm pointing out, the whole trouble with man is that he still holds on to this fatal hope of his. That somehow or another, the changing of one year into another is going to make a difference. And that something may be coming in 1956 which will put everything right. Now then, the question that arises for us is this. Why is it that men persist in that folly? Why is it that we will not learn the lesson of history? Why is it that this fatal hopefulness and optimism persists. And there's only one answer to the question. It's the Bible's answer. 
It is that man persistently refuses to face the fact that the whole trouble is in himself. That's the sole explanation. You see, we are always defending ourselves. We are always shielding ourselves. Our troubles, yes, we say there are troubles, but what are they due to? Well, we say they may be due to circumstances. After all, 1955 did, uh, says a man, happen to be a bad year for me. Circumstances so manipulated themselves that I had many troubles and problems. But of course, he says, the circumstances may be very different in 1956. They just happened to be like that then. But they may not be like that tomorrow and during this coming year. And therefore, he says, ah, you see, if circumstances are only different, all will be well. There'll be no troubles at all. Now, he's avoiding facing himself, so he puts it all into circumstances. Things that happen to us, other people, Always somebody else. You know, there were many who really did believe, I think, before the last war, that if we could only get rid of Hitler, there'd never be any more troubles in this world. But you see, they're still here. It's always somebody else, something else, always something external, anything to get away from myself. Or we may say that it's only a matter of time. Oh, I mustn't keep you with this. The whole essence of the trouble, I say, is this. That man refuses to realize and to confess that his troubles arise from himself. Now, that's exactly where the gospel begins to speak to us. Man is capable of this false optimism, this pathetic clinging on to time and to hope, for one reason only, and that is he has never realized the depth of the problem, the seriousness of the problem, which is the real truth about himself. Now, let me put it quite plainly. Unless you become a profound pessimist, you'll never become a Christian. Christianity knocks us down before it lifts us up. You cannot become a Christian without repenting. You've got to realize your utter hopelessness before you'll ever listen to Christ. Now, I am very anxious to impress this. Because it's a very good test, my friend, at this moment as to whether you're a Christian or not. If you regard the sort of thing that I'm saying as pessimism and discouraging, well, then you're just telling me that you're not a Christian. If you are holding on to life and its processes and to time, even to the slightest extent, you're not a Christian. That's the antithesis of Christianity. If you want to defend men, if you want to defend yourself, if you want to defend the world as it is, I say you're just telling me that you're not a Christian. For the Bible condemns men as he is. It condemns the world. And while the world remains as it is, the Bible has no hope for it whatsoever. Now, that's Christianity. That is the beginning of Christianity. It starts with this message. Flee from the wrath to come. Repent. Think again. Turn round. Change your mind. That's its message. That's the very beginning of the gospel. But as I'm saying, man will do anything that he can think of in order to avoid that. Oh, he says, things are bad enough without your making them worse. You needn't overpaint your picture. They're really not as bad as you are saying. My dear friend, they're very much worse than I'm capable of describing. My greatest defect as a preacher is that I do not realize as I should the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Do you know sin is as bad and as terrible as this, that nothing but the coming of the Son of God into the world could possibly deal with it? Art and culture, the philosophy of Greece and science, even the law that God himself gave to men, didn't and couldn't solve and was never meant to solve the problem. It was simply meant to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin. 
Very well then, I say, men holds on to this hope. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Why? Because man will not face himself and the truth about himself. What is the truth? Well, the truth is this. That the world is as it is this evening. And we all are what we are and as we are. Because of our wrong relationship to God. Because we are rebels against God. Because we have sinned against God. It's the whole message of this book. It has no message apart from that. That is its explanation of the world as it is this very evening. Man is in sin. He is out of relationship with God. God is the source of all blessing. And without God there is no blessing. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And the world tonight is an absolute proof of that. The world is in sin. The world has forgotten God. It's trying to live without him, making its own life apart from him. And still, it wants to be happy. It still believes it can be happy. 1956 may bring it, it says. Why? Well, because it's never faced this. That 1956 or 2056 or 2156, if there'll ever be such a time, none of it, if you can add millions of years, will ever change the situation while man remains what he is. That's the trouble. And you see, that is the explanation of the fact that the history of men has been quite unchanged ever since Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. That's why those Old Testament kings are such contemporary figures, aren't they? Great men and yet capable of mean, sordid, sinful, foul actions. You see, it's always this. Man's nature has become sinful. And that explains everything. Think of the things that are worrying you and troubling you at this moment. What do they do to? Now analyze them honestly and truly, fairly. And you'll find that every time it comes back to this, to sin. It's jealousy or envy or desire, lust, or passion, self-adulation, self-worship, the desire for position, power, place. These are the things that cause trouble. It's true in individuals. It's true in our personal relationships. It's true in the relationship of groups. Capital and labor, employer and employed. It's due between nations, groups of nations, iron curtains, bamboo curtains. Call them what you like. It all comes back to this. It's this self-centeredness, this selfishness, this putting of ourselves up and our refusal all together to bow the knee before God and to live for him and his glory. It explains everything. It's the only explanation. But there it is. And until we come back and realize that, my friend, there is no hope. Now you say that's pessimism. I say it's realism. Are you such an unintelligent person that you'd prefer me to stand in this pulpit and say, Ah, you know, 1956 is coming, and after all, if we can only get a better spirit amongst men... If we could only get them to come together and have their meetings and have their conferences. But I couldn't possibly say something like that and insult your intelligence. They've been having their conferences right through 1955. Now you say that's pessimism. I say it's realism. Are you such an unintelligent person that you'd prefer me to stand in this pulpit and say, Ah, you know, 1956 is coming and after all... If we can only get a better spirit amongst men, if we can only get them to come together and have their meetings and have their conferences. But I couldn't possibly say something like that and insult your intelligence. They've been having their conferences right through 1955. 
And every Christmas and every New Year's Day, year after year, the same things are said. An appeal to men to come together and to put these things into operation. But they don't do it. And I'll tell you why. As they are, they can't do it. What's in us will always come out. A man's nature will always express itself. Oh, I know he can camouflage it for a while. He can put on a new suit, as it were. He can dress himself up and deck himself. It isn't even skin deep. What's there does come out, and it will come out. And whether we like it or not, that is the truth about us. We are in sin. We are selfish, self-centered. We are governed by lusts and passions. We are out of a relationship with God. And all the troubles in the world tonight are just due to that and nothing else. Very well then, what has the gospel got to say about it? Well, its next step is this. It says that the problem being as deep and as drastic as that is a problem with which man cannot deal. This is pure gospel, this. The first thing the gospel tells you is that you can never put yourself right. Men can never put the world right. Now, that is the very heart of the gospel. Ah, the politicians say the opposite. They say, now, we can put it right. Well, all I say is this. They've had a very long time. Why don't they do it? They cannot do it. History proves that they cannot do it. Let me give you one quotation. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Of course he can't. So a man by taking thought cannot change himself. And he cannot find God. No, no, there is no hope for men left to himself. It doesn't matter how clever he is, how able, how wonderful. He cannot change his own nature. And as his nature is the cause of his troubles... How can he possibly find a cure? And what's the use of expecting 1956 to do it? What's the use of expecting changed conditions to do it? They can't do it. It's not for me to quote a man like the late Sir James Barry, J.M. Barry. With his sentimentality, but he at any rate saw that much. And he put it perfectly in that play of his called Dear Brutus. You can change people's circumstances, but that doesn't change them. And you know, my friends, I think that's tremendous. I glory in that fact. To me, it's an insult to man and his nature to suggest that if you only give him new surroundings, you'll make him a new man. You can't. I don't say this to amuse you. You don't change the nature of a pig by putting him into a new sty. And you don't change the nature of a man by putting him into a new house, or into a new suit, or into a new set of circumstances. No, no. Man's nature is too big for that. You can't change him by just changing his surroundings. Man cannot deal with it because it means... Changing himself, his own nature. Well, you say, there's no hope then. That's the end of it. No, no, my friends. That's where the gospel comes in, you see, with its positive message. Man cannot, but God can. Do you remember one afternoon our Lord had had an interview with a man who was called the rich young ruler? A wonderful young man, highly moral. He says he'd kept all the commandments. And he came to our Lord and asked him, Good Master, what must I do? And our Lord told him, Thou knowest the commandments. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. What more shall I do? Do you remember our Lord's reply to him? Go sell all that thou hast and come follow me. And he went away sorrowful. And the disciples had an awful shock. When they got into the house, they turned to their Lord and Master and said, Master, who then can be saved? 
If that man can't save himself, we know him. We know the kind of life he's living. He's moral, he's good, he's philanthropic. If he can't save himself, who then can be saved? And this was the reply. With men, it is impossible. Impossible. There's a categorical negative. With men, it is impossible. Have you got that? Have you realized you can't change your nature? That you can't put yourself right with God? And that you can't put your world right? Because men are in sin. With men it is impossible. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. Here you see is the hope. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. There is nothing new under the sun, says men. Quite right, says God. I make all things new. And here, my friend, is the only hope this evening. The only hope for the individual and the only hope for the world. It is in Christ. It is from God. And this, as I say, is the message of the whole Bible. Don't you see <coughs> that that is the whole message of the Old Testament? What is it? Well, they're looking forward to God's action. They are looking forward to God's coming Messiah. They all, those men of God, those prophets and seers, they're standing on tiptoe, waiting for what? For a new year? No, no. Waiting for God's year. The day of God's pleasure. The day that God has appointed. The coming of the Messiah. They're waiting for it. God's going to do something. That's your Old Testament. And when the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his own Son, made of a woman, made under the law. What for? Well, to redeem man in his hopelessness. The hope of the Old Testament has been actualized. It's been realized. Read your four Gospels and don't you see it there? Nothing surely stands out more clearly about those records than the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ gave hope to the hopeless and really changed everything for them. Look at his healing miracles. Look at those people who'd been bound by Satan in their diseases for so many years and the world had exhausted its remedies and they were condemned as hopeless. Suddenly he comes and at once they're put right. Think of the men at the beautiful, at that gate of the temple, at the pool of Bethesda. Thirty-eight years and more he'd lived and had been incapable of walking. And there he is. And our Lord says unto him, Well, what are you doing here? And his reply is, Well, he says, I've often tried to get into that water when it's disturbed. But somebody always gets in before me. And I'm always out. The world's against me. I'm hopeless. And Christ speaks a word to him. And he's right. Isn't that the whole story? Publicans and sinners were regarded as outsiders by the good and respectable people. They wouldn't touch them. They wouldn't look at them. Christ sat down and ate with them. Hope even for them. Oh, there is a sense, you know, in which the whole of this point is perfectly put in the parable of the prodigal son. There's a man who comes to the very end of his tether. He's got nothing left at all and no man gave unto him. Couldn't help himself. Nobody else would or could help him. He's absolutely finished, down and out. But the whole point of the parable is just to say that his father is ready and is waiting because he's his father. And our Lord's purpose is to say this, that's God. That's God. 
And every one of us in sin by nature is as hopeless as that. Oh, of course, we recognize it in some cases, don't we? There are some people who are the hopeless, helpless victims of drink. They can't control it. They can do nothing at all about it. They'd give the world if they could stop, but they cannot. They're absolutely in the grip of the thing, and science has tried to deliver them, but cannot. Nothing can be done. Oh, yes, God can, and God has. That's the gospel. Men and women throughout the centuries who've been written off by the world as beyond the pale, hopeless, nothing can be done for them. In Christ Jesus have become new men and women. Well, how does he do it? Well, let me just remind you of the very elements of this matter before I sit down. The primary need of the whole of mankind is to be blessed by God. I say our troubles are due to the fact that we are in the wrong relationship to God and are not being blessed in consequence by God. So our first need, our central need, is to be blessed of God. How can I be blessed of God? Well, the first thing I need is this, I must be reconciled to God. God will not bless men who are slaves to sin and slaves to Satan. The first thing everybody needs is to be reconciled to God. No, no, it isn't your circumstances. It isn't anything else. It's you. It's your heart of sin. It's your wrong relationship to God. That must be put right first. And there's only one way of doing it, and that is in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He sent his Son from heaven to earth to deal with this very problem we're discussing together. Man in sin, man as a rebel, man opposed to God and out of relationship. He sent his son to put that right, and that's how he puts it right. Something must be done about our sins before God can smile upon us, and God has done it in Christ. He's taken our sins and put them unto Christ and has dealt with them in Christ and therefore he reconciles us to himself. Realize that and you're in the right relationship to God. But thank God it doesn't stop at that. It does start with that, my friend. I don't know. There may be somebody listening to me at this moment who hasn't been in a place of worship for a, for a year or for years. You may have fallen into sin so that you're miserable and unhappy. You're down and out and you see the mistake and the folly and the wretchedness of your past. My dear friend, I am delighted to be able to tell you this on the authority of God's word. If you truly realize this evening that the real trouble with your past life has not been so much the bestial side of it as the fact that you've been sinning against God and that you've been grieving him and wounding him and hurting him, that you've been a rebel against him. If you can say with the prodigal, I have sinned against heaven, before you say, and before thy face, to some human being, start with God. If you repent and acknowledge and confess your sins, I assure you in the name of God that the whole of your past is blotted out at this moment. You believe that Christ has died for your sins and I tell you that all your sins are blotted out by God as a thick cloud. Look here, you're as much forgiven as the best person in this congregation. I don't care how low you went. I don't care if you've been in the gutters of sin. I don't care if you're so foul that nobody will look at you. I say if you look to Christ and trust him, that God receives you, that you're reconciled to God as much as any one of us. The past shall be forgotten. It starts there, but I say, thank God, it doesn't stop there. It then goes on to offer us a new nature, a new life. It makes us new men and women. Notice what I'm saying. I don't say that it changes the world. I say it changes you. You'll go back into the same world, but you'll be different. You'll have a new nature, 
a new mind, a new outlook, a new understanding. The Apostle Paul puts that in these memorable words. If any man be in Christ, he says he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Not because it isn't 1955 and it is 1956. No, no. But because you are no longer the same person. You know what really matters in life is not the things that happen, but the way in which you look at them. A man once started a book with these words, it isn't life that matters, but the courage that you bring to it. It isn't the things that are there, it's the way we see them. A primrose by a river's brim, a yellow primrose was to him, and it was nothing more. That's one man. Ah, yes, but there's another man who can say to me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that too often lie too deep for tears. And that's what the gospel does. It changes us. It gives us new eyes. The circumstances remain. We are different. The world is new. Not because it's changed, because I've been changed. He gives us a new life and a new nature. He gives us a new power. And we are conscious of his presence and of his nearness. And therefore... All things have become new. You can think of men, can't you? You may have known them as I've known them, to whom a public house used to mean one thing at one time. Now it's something absolutely different. The same public house. It isn't the public house that's changed. It's the man that's changed. That's how he makes all things new. This is the beginning of it. And there, you see, is the real hope of the gospel. God does it. I make all things new. Nobody else can do it. He's the maker. He's almighty. He's the creator. He made you out of nothing. He can make you anew. It's his power, not ours. I'm not asking you to write out a number of New Year's resolutions and to stick to them and to keep them. I know you won't keep them till tomorrow. No, no. I say put yourself into the hands of God. Let the maker, the creator, make you anew. Bring a new creation into being. That's how he does it. And he does that at once and immediately. But you know that's only the beginning of a very great program. There is a day coming when everything that you've been reading there in that book of Revelation is literally going to come to pass. I mean this. There is a day coming in the plan and the purpose and the program of God when the literal universe is going to be changed. I hope you notice how I'm putting it. For the present, the world will remain as it is, but you will be changed. And you will feel that you're in a new world, though it is exactly as it was. Oh, yes. Yes. But there is a day coming when the world itself shall be changed. There is a day coming when there shall be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. This old world that you and I know so well, it's going to be purged of sin and evil. All that is wrong and vile and filthy is going to be extruded out of it. And the world itself, the whole cosmos, shall be absolutely perfect. There is a day coming when this world is going to be a paradise again, a place of glory, wherein the children of God shall live and dwell and enjoy themselves in the presence of their Lord. It's coming. It's coming for certain. Not because 1955 ends and 1956 begins. No, no. But because the Son of God comes again. Back into the world as the judge. As the purifier. As the cleanser. As the judge eternal. And he will reign in this renovated, perfect world. And the great question, therefore, is this. 
Will you be there with him enjoying it? You noticed what we were told in this chapter? There are certain things and certain persons who remain outside. They alone are going to enjoy this, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name there? Are you tired of sin? Are you tired of the world as it is? Do you really want this new thing? Do you want to enjoy it and be a participator in it? I've already told you the one way to be certain of that is to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you belong to him by acknowledging your own sinfulness and your own helplessness. By believing the message concerning him that he died for your sins, that he has done the work himself altogether by committing yourself to him, being led by him, walking with him, looking to him, trusting to him, forsaking the world for his sake, and waiting upon him. He says, Behold, I make all things new. Ask him to make you anew, to give you a new heart, a new outlook, a new orientation, and tell him that you want to join the ranks of those who are waiting for the coming day when the whole world, the whole universe, shall be made new. And there will be no sun and no moon because his blessed face shall be light sufficient. There shall be no night, but we shall bask in and enjoy his glory in the light of an endless day. Oh, what a hope. A certain hope because it is based upon God. And what God can do. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.